What's up, guys? Welcome back to Newswave. So we, we have to go over some statements from Google about Stadia because it uh, it definitely seemed to kind of turn the internet upside down yesterday when everyone was looking at some of these statements from them and how apparently it's going to be matching local play in a couple of years. They did give us an idea and a strategy as to what they're going to be doing, kind of getting there, and we're going to go over that today. Also, a Switch Pro Controller revision or a new Pro Controller appears to have been quietly released and people are wondering if there's anything really different about it. Well, I did pick one up open it up just to check it out. So I'll let you guys know if it's something that you need to go out and pick up. We'll, we'll talk a bit about that. As always, guys, enjoy these videos. Make sure you hit the like button. It does help out and get subscribed so you can stay up to date. All the gaming news going on in the gaming world. We're actually gonna start today with Resident Evil 5 and 6. Of course, that's coming out on the Switch uh, pretty soon. And a lot of people have been looking at them and trying to figure out if they should pick them up, uh, especially if you haven't played it before. I do think Resident Evil 5 is still a great game. Uh, the pricing, I, I think, is like $30 right now digitally, and that's mm, that might be a bit much, but uh, but we do have demos and that was an interesting thing to see pop up. I don't really know why we need demos for them considering they're older games and people have probably already played them, but I guess it's good for, I guess to see how it performs. Anyway, you can check them out. They, it was kind of weird because they weren't up immediately yesterday and they should hopefully be up by now, unless you change your region. I believe uh, Japan had them at that time and I think Europe as well. So it might've just been like, oh, it's gonna go live later on in the in US standard time but you can go check them out. They are both on the larger side, by the way, 15 to 16 gigabytes for each one, uh, but definitely check the demo out to see if it's something you're interested in. Oh, and get this, if, if you think hard drives aren't big enough now, well, we've talked about the games yesterday or the other day during the PlayStation 5 reveal stuff, and I kinda was hoping we'd get to a point where games would start to get smaller just because redundancies would be taking, taken like out of the files, and I think we need that because we saw some minimum system requirements for Call of Duty that's out on the 25th, and uh, check this out. 175 gigabytes is the minimum size for the PC. Now, of course, it's designed, like I said, with redundancies and stuff built in. Mark Cerny did a pretty good job trying to explain that as clear as possible there. And hopefully, when games are designed specifically to run off of SSDs, which... Yeah, I guess when the next systems show up, uh, if you're on PC, you're probably gonna have to upgrade. If you haven't already, I think most people have, they're cheap enough at this point to at least boot your OS off of it. But it seems like if they don't at least shrink down, you're gonna need a pretty big SSD. Like we're talking terabytes in size. Those are getting down in price as well. And uh, Red Dead Redemption 2, going to PC as well, that one's 150 gigabytes. So yeah, it's not just Call of Duty necessarily, although I am curious why Call of Duty is bigger than Red Dead Redemption 2. That seems a bit strange, but there you go. If you're getting Call of Duty on the PC, might wanna start clearing out some space to make sure you're ready. We also got a look at the Galarian Ponyta that they showed off. They show this in a video you're seeing here. And it looks, what I, the thing about this is really interesting is people pointed this out. Apparently it's not a fairy type Pokemon despite people uh, thinking at first that it was. And it appears that this Galarian Ponyta will be unique to Pokemon Shield. So unfortunately, if you were thinking about getting Pokemon Sword and, and getting this Ponyta, you won't be able to. So you'll have to do what we've been doing since the 90s, I guess, and find somebody to trade. At least we, we believe obviously you'll be able to trade online. So there's that. Uh, I'm curious is what then will be, I guess, unique to Sword, as we could see some more older Pokemon that most of us may know for a while now, maybe get a Galarian form, we'll see, but so far it looks like we at least have one here that's specifically for Shield. Also, there may be hope for a Final Fantasy VIII remake. We had talked before about Final Fantasy VII Remake going through so many issues, and at least now it looks like we're gonna get the first chunk of the game. Well, we have now had the Final Fantasy VII producer talk in an interview about Final Fantasy VIII getting a remake, a full-on remake, saying, if the youth that inherits the genes of Final Fantasy can step up and do it, then I'd like to see it made for Final Fantasy VII Remake. The project started from my desire to make remake Final Fantasy VII with today's technology, and while I'm still here at Square Enix, so I'd like to see it done by the youth of Square Enix. And that that is uh, Yoshinori Katais talking to Famitsu about it, and, well, hey, I guess if there uh, are young younger people or younger developers at Square that would like to do this, I'd be all for it. I think that'd be really neat to see, but let's get Final Fantasy VII at least 
out of Midgar before we start talking about an 8 remake. And hey, there's still Chrono Trigger. Maybe that would be a good one to do. And guys, some of the quick that way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start with this Switch Pro Controller revision, this new Switch Pro Controller that's been quietly released. It was actually noticed on Twitter and on Reset Era Forum uh, by Sig, who posted pictures of the back. And if you look on the back by the barcode, there is a model number that goes 104889E, and this signifies a new Pro Controller variant. Now, here's the thing. We've seen Pro Controller variants in the past, and at times they actually had some improvements inside, and other times they just probably were changing around some of the internals or plastics or going to different manufacturers, and they just did a cutoff, and they said, okay, now we're going to restart here, and we're going to change the model on the back so we know, you know, when we started it up and everything. I, that's what I would assume. Uh, but this one caught some people's eyes because it's been a little while, I think, since we've had a variant. So I went out and picked it up. I found it at a Best Buy as people said that they were starting to see them show up with new shipments. Managed to find it, took it apart because people were asking if there is any improvements around. Of course, the big thing being the D-pad. That seems to be the one thing people point to on the Pro Controller that is like the big issue. Everything else around it seems pretty solid. I haven't really had any issues with my uh, joysticks or anything, no drifting or weird presses, nothing like that. So when I got it, I took it apart. I posted pictures on uh, Twitter showing that it appears to have been produced in May, so a few months ago. And it looks like the D-pad, from what I can tell, is almost exactly the same. The spike in the middle, the plastic spike, appears to be, I would say, maybe like a millimeter longer than the one that's in my Xenoblade controller, which of course is a much older Pro controller. So I don't see a massive change. Uh, the D-pad on it feels a bit more clicky, I guess is the right word for it. However, that could also just be, you know, a new controller versus one that's been used for a while now, you know, aged pretty well and taken a beating from button presses on that D-pad. So I'm looking at this thinking right now, I wouldn't go out and pick it up as like, uh, oh, I gotta go get it because the D-pad is that much better or the joysticks. It seems otherwise pretty much the same inside. The markings, the chips on the board and the analog sticks all appear to be pretty much exactly the same. Some of the plastics are marked slightly different. However, that just might be like on the assembly line, they grab different plastics and they have it set up uh, slightly different. So no, nothing crazy with this, this uh, Switch Pro Controller variant that you may have seen online, still pretty much the standard Pro Controller. Next up, let's talk about the PlayStation VR 2. So look, we, we kind of figure there will be another PlayStation VR with the PlayStation 5, considering the current PlayStation VR has been very popular, actually. It's sold, I think, close to 4 million units now, and it's still kind of rolling along despite no one really talking about it. Here's the thing, if I really talk about it on YouTube, no one seems to really care as much, and that might be because, I guess, just the install size is still fairly small, and VR is still pretty young in its current form. It's, VR has been around for a long time, but like with the console manufacturers tackling it, it's, uh, it's still kind of young right now. Now, so when I saw this patent, which popped up, Let's Go Digital managed to dig this one up from February of 2019, I'm getting a bit more excited about this, mostly because as you're seeing with three of these images here, we have uh, figure 13, 14, and 17. Uh, it does show, what, it, what appears to be anyway, a wireless headset, which is the biggest issue I have currently with the PlayStation VR and pretty much any headset now that's not like the Oculus Rift, even that's not unfortunately uh, strong enough with their Oculus Quest series that they have with the Rift. Uh, it's not strong enough with the Quest to play some of the crazier, you know, bigger games. Uh, this would be a massive deal if they can make it work. It appears that it's actually trying to use Bluetooth, which is, that would be fascinating to see how that would all work out. Uh, and then they have what almost looks like a toilet bowl wand for a controller. Uh, that is still to be determined when it comes to control. See, if I see controller patents, I'm always like, maybe, you know, eh, okay, maybe, because they, those change so much. We've seen what like the PlayStation 3 boomerang controller looked like, and they had that actually made and in front of us, and they changed that heavily. So um, I, I don't really ever look at controller patents as being anything other than ideas, but that headset is going in the right direction. Wireless VR is like the next big step because there's just too many wires to hook up. I don't feel like doing all of that. So if they can get it there, I'm very, very interested, and I think some people will actually try VR then. Next up, let's talk about Google Stadia and some of these uh, 
kind of crazy, almost outlandish claims that they're making right now. It almost makes me wonder if Comcast is just laughing it up, like, oh yeah, you guys are gonna get that working? Not with not with our data caps, you're not. <laughs> uh, no, but, but looking at this, Google Stadia, the biggest thing it has to overcome is latency. I mean, seriously, pressing a button on your controller, it traveling to the data center and then coming back showing up on your screen, eh, it's gonna be quite a bit to get around, but it seems like Google's coming up with a couple of ideas to make that happen. They're not necessarily new ideas, although they are using some really funny terms to describe it. This was actually in an interview with one of Google's top streaming engineers saying, ultimately we think in a year or two, we'll have games that are running faster and feel more responsive in the cloud than they do locally, regardless of how powerful the local machine is. Now you might be wondering, how are they going to do that? How are they gonna overcome the latency? Well, according to them, the best way for them to actually do that is to figure out a way to predict what button you are going to press next, and they call that negative latency. Now that's not necessarily new. In fact, you may have already played a game that's used uh, methods to kind of predict button presses and try to make it all seem very seamless online. We're gonna go over that in a second, but essentially you might be playing a game and they probably have, I, I assume they're gonna use their servers and AI and everything machine learning to try to maybe learn your patterns or try to figure out what might come after another button press, whether it's you fire your bullets all the way down and then you're about to reload it, it it tries to figure that out so that you may not even notice it because it might just shave off a couple of milliseconds, but it's able to get that responsiveness, basically cue up an idea of what you're gonna be doing. And if it's true, then it'll immediately do it. So it's a bit faster. I don't think it's gonna be night and day like they believe, but if you could just shave off 10, 15 milliseconds, they can just keep working towards what your local latency is with your controller. They're doing a lot of stuff. Your controller syncs to the Wi-Fi to kind of bypass the Bluetooth on something like your phone or your or your desktop or laptop. They're doing any little thing they can to get down. And, and like I said, this isn't necessarily the first thing that's used this idea. In fact, this is pretty old. This is dating back to like 2008, 2009, that I can remember with a uh, middleware or net code known as GGPO or Good Game Peace Out. And this has actually been used in things like uh, Skullgirls and Dive Kick and Killer Instinct. So if you've played some of those games, it's also several others, you may have already played a game that uses something similar. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to leverage the kind of stuff that I'm sure Google has with, you know, an army of engineers and uh, and their own massive server base and everything and the farms that they have there, server farms. So I'm curious if this is a way they can conquer that latency. And I have a strong feeling Microsoft is cooking up something of their own as well with similar with something like Azure to kind of work this out. Either way, the streaming wars are, are heating up here with Sony, Microsoft, and Google all going for it. And uh, we'll see how all this turns out, but I think at least for now, my main gaming is still gonna stick with, you know, an Xbox, a PlayStation, or a Switch, just locally. But you never know what could happen, especially with the mainstream if they realize that all they gotta do is click a button and they could play the game, especially that one that's like 175 gigabytes. That's gonna take a while to install. And our last bit of news, let's talk about Analog. Uh, I like Analog, their, their products are great. The Super NT, for example, the Mega SG, and those are devices that will play Super Nintendo games or Genesis games, lag-free straight up, and it's done through FPGA. So it's all hardware-based, not software emulation necessarily, like you might see with a Retron 5, for example, or your, I guess, technically Raspberry Pi or anything like that. No, this is straight up and it works great. So when I start to hear more and more about a possible announcement coming from them that could be big, like really big, I'm excited. They posted this on Twitter. October 16th, 2019, 8 a.m. Pacific time. So next week, we're gonna find out something from them. And looking back over some of their trademarks, remember we talked about this in a previous news wave, you remember this one right here? The Analog Pocket? That is a trademark that they made, and it's all kind of coming full circle here, and a lot of us believe, anyway, at this time, we could be looking at a, a an Analog Game Boy of some kind. Now, I don't know if it's gonna play Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance. I'd like to think it, it might, and maybe they're going the route of working towards the Game Boy Advance chip, right, and, and do that because that was fully backwards compatible or maybe they're just gonna tackle just Game Boy or Game Boy Color along with that right now. But to hear about a high quality Game Boy is exciting. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that that's absolutely what this will be. They could be announcing really anything at this point, but 
their trademarks and them hyping up an announcement kind of feels like that's what we might be looking at. Either way though, if it is the Game Boy, you could be sure I'm picking it up and we're gonna take a look at it because that is some exciting stuff if we can get a high quality Game Boy that you put your cartridges in and it plays it one to one. Exciting stuff. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Nathan and Shelly saying, I'd love to hear your take on the whole Blizzard censorship fiasco. So I've been following this pretty much throughout the week. The problem I have with this is it, as, as I'm like, all right, I think I got this all set up. It's gonna take a while to go over because there's a lot of stuff. More stuff keeps happening. We just had Blizzard start to block accounts apparently from being shut down and removed. Like, so you, if you wanna, you know, boycott them by by not buying stuff or, or canceling your account or anything or, or wiping out, I guess, your Blizzard account if you'd like to your battle.net, uh, you can't. And that was kind of an issue. And it looks like, at least for now, I'm really waiting for something from Activision. I, I need some kind of press release. I need a statement and they're not giving it to me. And it's really frustrating because this is a situation that needs to be addressed immediately by them like now, and it's not happening. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping by the time we get to the podcast this Saturday night, they'll have something out there for us. So then we can kind of get together and talk about it on that podcast for as long as we need to, because to be honest, that might end up being something that would take me like 15 to 20 minutes to talk about just in a video. Either way, though, I'm sure we'll talk about it, even if there isn't a statement on the Spawncast, go over it, because that is a pretty big deal, and even though that does kind of deal with, like, politics and stuff, it definitely is a situation that involves gamers heavily. And ladies and gentlemen, let's go to it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit the like button, it really helps out. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about today, whether it is Google Stadia and their negative latency. What do you think about that idea, and are you going to check out Stadia next month? I am. Like I said, I, I figure we check it out here on the channel just to see how all of this goes down and their UI and everything. It could at least be interesting just to see how it all, uh, I guess, functions. Or I guess the Switch Pro revision, Switch Pro controller revision, I should say. Uh, what do you think about that? Or are you picking one up? Uh, no real major change there. Or the PlayStation VR 2 possibly being wireless. Is that how, is that how you get into VR? If it becomes completely wireless and much easier to set up. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.